Good morning, Senator Peters. Thank you so much for taking time to be with me this morning and answer a few questions. How are you? I'm doing well, Seth. Thanks. Uh, thanks for having me uh, on the program. And uh, I, I love all the guitars behind you there. And uh, once again, I appreciate uh, the song you uh, adapted uh, of, uh, at a previous meeting that we had. Thank you for uh, sharing your talent. Oh, my pleasure. Uh, thank you for everything you're doing. And uh, I know you have a very busy schedule, six days until uh, election day. So thank That's you right. for taking time. Um, so we'll just get right into it here and talk about water. That's great. I appreciate it. Thank you, Seth. Thank you. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's been a time here, been a big year uh, in so many ways. And with regard to the Great Lakes, you know, we've seen record high water levels and a changing climate. So I'm curious, what do you see as the greatest threats to the Great Lakes and uh, what measures are you taking to combat these threats? Well, there, there are a number of threats uh, for the Great Lakes, uh, as you know, and, and I'll just, you know, step back and say as Michiganders, uh, we, I think the Great Lakes is in our DNA. We understand how important it is to make sure that we protect them for, for ourselves and for future generations uh, that, uh, that, you know, here we have this amazing body of water that provides drinking water uh, for 40 million people. Uh, that's, uh, that's a re incredible resource. And, you know, next to our people, uh, they're the greatest resource we have. So we have to, we have to protect them from a variety of uh, threats. So one of the overarching threats, you mentioned the, the rising levels is of course, climate change. Climate change uh, touches uh, everything. And so we have to, to lean into addressing that and being uh, aggressive. That's why I support uh, policies to get us to carbon neutral by 2050, uh, looking at uh, alternative energy programs for our automobiles, for example. I have a, have a Vehicle Innovation Act that I've passed through the Senate. We're gonna repass it to try to get it through to have uh, uh, um, uh, automobiles uh, start diversifying uh, their power plants and particularly move uh, towards electric. But then again, of course, we have to have the, a power grid that's also uh, being generated by renewable uh, energy. And uh, so those are, you know, that's a the major, major effort. But if we think about some of the uh, specific uh, challenges, uh, one, I've always uh, been concerned about uh, oil uh, contamination of uh, the Great Lakes, uh, that we have to deal with that uh, and, and pipelines in particular. You know, we had the, the largest, most expensive pipeline break in history in this country in the Kalamazoo River, over a billion dollars of, uh, of damage uh, to the ecosystem. We have an old aging pipeline in the Straits of Mackinac that I'm very concerned about. I think that that pipe as it is has to go. It can't just be sitting there on the lake bed like that and, uh, and, uh, and risk uh, contamination to this incredible body of water. That's why I've passed, I've written and passed legislation to make uh, pipelines in the Great Lakes Basin subjected to the strictest federal oversight uh, possible. Also looking at cleanup plans and, and have actually uh, uh, wrote legislation to create a center of expertise for the Coast Guard on how you clean up uh, oil spills uh, in fresh water, which is a lot more uh, problematic and more difficult to, to do. But the other one uh, area that I'm really focused on in terms of water quality is dealing with PFAS uh, contamination, uh, something that I've uh, leaned into heavily. Uh, PFAS, as I'm sure you're, you're uh, uh, your folks here on the podcast know is uh, is the for, forever chemical. Uh, once it gets in the environment, it literally stays there forever. In fact, I had the first hearing on PFAS uh, before the U.S. Senate and my oversight committee. And one of the uh, scientists said that, uh, she said, uh, just to give you a sense of what I mean by forever, uh, uh, millions of years from now, if, if humans are still around and they're looking at the rock strata from our era, they will find PFAS in the rock strata. I mean, that's truly a forever chemical the impact on the environment, the impact of the human health that we're learning more about and how devastating it is. And of the 700 PFAS toxic sites across the country, 200 of them are in Michigan. Uh, and, and we've got to clean these up, uh, but we also have to stop the stuff from getting into the environment in the first place. Uh, we, we shouldn't put it in the environment and try to clean it up. We should just keep it out of the environment to, to begin with. Uh, that's why I've worked on a number of fronts. One of the areas or PFAS, and PFAS is water repellent, it's stain resistance, uh, it's, uh, it's on Teflon pans, old Teflon pans, you know, things non-stick kind of surfaces, but it's also in firefighting foam. And uh, especially around air bases, I serve on the Armed Services Committee, you see contamination. We have that at the Wordsmith Air Force Base, well, former uh, Air Force Base uh, 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 in Oscoda. And, and, you know, you have this stuff uh, out there, it's contaminated the areas. Uh, so how do we stop the firefighting from, from even being used? Uh, I've, I've written and passed legislation to phase it out. 
So we stop uh, putting this stuff into the ground. But of course, it's a real risk to the firefighters themselves. You can imagine using this stuff and having that your body exposed to that. So, so we have to be very aggressive. But we has to also have to force the EPA to put a standard in place to clean this stuff up. And that's a major frustration for me. The Trump administration refuses to do that. Of course, they have an EPA in right now, the Environmental Protection Agency. And the Trump administration basically is trying to weaken standards for clean water, weaken standards for clean air, but all of these basics, uh, which is why, uh, to turn this political, why we have to make sure we have a Democratic administration. That's why I'm supporting uh, Joe Biden. And, and Joe Biden's going to need help. He needs a Democratic U.S. Senate, which is why my reelection campaign is so important that we can have environmental advocates and champions uh, back in power in Washington to be able to, to turn, that, uh, turn that back. And we're fighting a lot of billionaires right now. In fact, those billionaires are, are airing a, a lot of nasty negative ads against me that have been all rated as false by fact checkers. And, and one of those uh, groups uh, is the Koch brothers uh, who are, make money from fossil fuels. And, and I actually fought the Koch brothers back in 2014. Here's an example of how we have to protect the Great Lakes. They had huge piles of pet coke, which is the residual from refining dirty Canadian tar sands oil. Uh, and they had this big pile along the Detroit River. It was blowing into people's homes and into their businesses. It was going into the Great Lakes. Uh, I fought and worked closely with community activists. We eventually had it removed. But that's who we're fighting against in this campaign. People who think it's okay to pile a huge a pile of this stuff in a neighborhood and impact their health and let it uh, run into the Great Lakes. Uh, it, it is uh, all of these folks who... Uh, uh, are threatening our lakes need to be held accountable and we need to make sure that we're aggressively working to keep the lakes as clean as possible for for generations to come. Mm. Thank you so much for that thorough answer. Um, really appreciate everything you brought up and and congratulations also on your endorsements from uh, many environmental groups here in Michigan, uh, partners of ours, League of Conservation Voters. And... Right, right. Uh, no, I'm pleased to have the environmental yeah. community uh, all uh, behind me, and uh, but it uh, it is uh, this is a, one of the most consequential elections we'll ever face, and the environment is definitely on the on the ballot. So all, for all the folks watching here, the environment is on the ballot. Make sure you're voting for environmental champions, and um, I'm proud to have the support of every major environmental group in the country supporting my campaign. Mm. <clears throat> so my next question has to do with water equity and environmental justice. Uh, so, so we know that black and brown communities, indigenous communities are disproportionately harmed by environmental degradation and also, also uh, disproportionately limited in access to the basic human right of clean, affordable drinking water. So we've seen failures of governance on the state level through emergency management that have led to the Detroit water shutoffs and the Flint water crisis here in Michigan in recent years. Right now, in the midst of COVID-19, a lot of people are still struggling to have their water turned back on. Um, and so what actions are you taking at the federal level to work for water equity, water affordability, and environmental justice as a whole? Mm -hmm. Well, that's an incredibly uh, important question and one that we have to focus on. And actually, a couple of the things that I mentioned in the previous answer are related to environmental justice, as you, you know very well. Uh, those pet coke piles, uh, those, those were not in a, they, they were not in a rich suburban community. That's not where they piled uh, those pet coke piles. Uh, and when you look at PFAS contaminated sites, uh, those also uh, are environmental justice uh, uh, issues uh, as well. And uh, that's unacceptable. Uh, no matter who you are, no matter where you live, uh, you should have access to clean water, to clean air, to be able to live uh, or have the rights that every American uh, should have. And so we have to aggressively push back against it. That's why I pushed back against the pet coke and had it removed from that area that was impacting people. And particularly uh, young folks who were breathing in that stuff and had all sorts of uh, uh, breathing uh, ailments uh, and exacerbating uh, asthma, other kinds of things that folks have in terms of, of human health. So uh, we have to be very aggressive in that area. We also have to make sure, as you mentioned, uh, Flint and the, and the water crisis um, is that I've been very involved, worked closely with my colleague, Debbie Stabenow, and then Dan Kildy, the congressperson uh, from Flint. Uh, we worked uh, together. And during the crisis, we were able to secure over $100 million of federal money to go in and fix that system, to be able to pull out the lead service lines, to, to be able to fix uh, the, the kind of the underground structure that was all damaged as a result of this water that was being pumped through that wasn't treated, as you know, for, uh, for, uh, for uh, the corrosive impact of it, which 
was just eating away at all the lead service lines and the lead that was in an old water system. So it's really, uh, so we were able to, to uh, do that, but still trust, it takes a long time to build trust. And I get that, I understand that and it will take time. But we have to understand that what happened in Flint can happen in places all across the country, and especially these older cities that have older systems that were built uh, uh, before a lot of the regulations may have been in place. And so uh, I'm aggressively working uh, to uh, have an infrastructure program. We have to invest in infrastructure. Hopefully we will do that in the next Congress. We're going to need democratic control of the U.S. Senate to make that happen. We have to have Democrats in the Senate or Republicans will, will block it. Uh, but we, we have to fix under, underground, not just roads and bridges, it's also the underground infrastructure. In many of our older urban areas, it's the underground infrastructure that needs to be replaced. And these are communities that simply can't afford it. They need help. Uh, we got to be a partner. So we should be able to work in partnership uh, and make that part of any kind of uh, infrastructure plan uh, that, uh, that we put forward. Fantastic. Thank you. So in closing here, uh, music is a big part of everything we do with Title Track and the Clean Water Campaign. We recognize the power of music to, to bring people together and to raise community awareness and self-awareness. Um, so I'm curious, what music do you listen to, Gary, for inspiration? And it's a two-part question. If you could choose any musical act in all of history to play at a campaign rally um, without the uh, problem of COVID. So this is a little bit of fantasy. But... The good old days. We got to get back to those good old days. <laughs> yeah. If you could choose any musical act in all of history to play at one of your campaign rallies, who would it be? Yeah, I know, you know, I, I'm a Steely Dan uh, fan. I think we've talked about that before. That's why you uh, did your version of that. So, uh, you know, I, I love uh, Steely Dan. Uh, I love the Eagles. Uh, those are all from my youth. Uh, uh, are great bands. You know, you talk about, so I don't know about an act. I don't know some of that music. I'd have to think about what music for, for activists, but I would enjoy hearing from, from both, both of them. I'll tell you, just as a aside, we do from a song perspective, mm -hmm. uh, when we have campaign rallies, uh, we can have a song as we jump on stage, you know, to kind of get the, the crowd uh, going. Uh, and this is, a, this is an oldie, but goodie, but it, it's uh, Steppenwolf, uh, uh, born to be wild. I have uh, play when I get up and I'll tell you the story behind that because I'm an avid motorcyclist uh, and I ride my Harley Davidson all across uh, the state and, uh, and over the summer I actually do a kind of an official event with riders but it, that's really if you ask about an escape um, uh, being on my motorcycle with the wind in my face and uh, riding along the Great Lakes, let's put it that, there's nothing better. It's the, it's the full glory of Michigan and the open road. And uh, usually in my head, I'm thinking Steppenwolf, uh, Born to be Wild. I mean, that's like uh, one of my favorite motorcycle tunes. So I don't know if I'd have them play at a rally, but uh, it's a song that I certainly love uh, when I get on stage because then I'm, uh, I'm thinking I'm uh, out there on the open road with the wind in my face and nothing better than that. Amazing. Thank you so much. And so uh, tell us where people can learn more about your platform, your campaign. Well, you can learn more at uh, my website, which is petersformichigan.com and uh, learn more about the campaign. And one thing I'd really love folks, we have a, we have a, a digital toolbox there too, so they can go and uh, hopefully we'll help the campaign. As I mentioned, this is an incredibly important one. The, the out-of-state billionaires are pouring money against me. We need, uh, we need environmental activists to really lean in and, and we have a bunch of digital postcards, including some environmental messages. And if folks would uh, send those postcards out to their email list and social media, uh, it would be really helpful. Uh, it cuts through all the clutter of the nastiness we're seeing on TV and uh, have some people-to-people uh, -people contact, which is really important right now in these final few days. Hmm. Well, thank you for your time. Thank you for everything you're doing for clean water and, and human rights. And uh, best of luck to you in the coming weeks and months. Well, I appreciate it. So you take care. Stay safe. Thank you so much, Gary. Take care. Bye-bye.